And welcome to this special segment of TI Now. We're here with Kishore Ramachandran. He's a professor of computer science at Georgia Tech. And Kishore, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for being here. We're going to be talking about uh, the inter Internet of Things and really the evolution of that and also the deployment of the Internet of Things uh, in present day. But before we do that, I'd like to go back a couple years. And if you can describe for us really that evolution from maybe the industrial machine-to-machine uh, -machine age, if you will, to what we know now as the Internet of Things. So the machine-to-machine -machine is uh, what you're alluding to. I would say it goes farther back than that. Uh, you know, back in, uh, I would say, 1991, uh, Mark Weiser at uh, Xerox PARC uh, had this vision of ubiquitous computing. And, um, and he called it ubiquitous computing at that point of time. And his idea was that technology should just sort of hide into the landscape of things. So we don't really uh, know that technology exists, but it just does things for us. And uh, so that was sort of the vision back in 1991, way before any of these things come into play. And I think as uh, technology progressed, net networking technology progressed, computing technology progressed, uh, devices became more uh, capable. Uh, uh, machine to machine communications ca uh, came about in, uh, uh, in the past several, uh, I would say in the last decade or so. And, uh, and now, uh, you know, these have several different names. I mean, you can say Internet of Things. And if you talk to a different community, they'll say cyber physical systems. Uh, all of these things uh, are uh, essentially saying that there is so much of uh, um, uh, 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 devices, sensing devices in the environment that is producing data, um, and, 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 and that data can be harnessed to do different things that enhances the quality of life um, and, uh, and, and um, enhances um, uh, safety on the roads and so on and so forth. So that's, I would say, the path that all the way from, I would say, the uh, uh, early 19, 1990, uh, we've come to this point where networking technology and wireless networking te technology in particular um, has come to a point where we can have this kind of uh, convolution of all of these uh, factors coming into play, making it possible today. And, and, and as you probably know, Internet of Things means different things to different people. Um, uh, so that's something that I would like to point out as well. Now, um, you mentioned, you alluded to this a little bit, really the tipping point, let's fast forwarding 20, 25 years, yeah. uh, when we really realize the true value of connecting things. Yeah. Um, what happened at that point? Let's just even rewind maybe to 2011. Well, I think the turning point is, uh, first of all, companies like IBM starting to realize that the margin in devices has shrunk so much, and it is really about services what you can provide as an end service. I mean, it used to be a time that, you know, uh, companies like IBM were peddling uh, uh, boxes, and, and that's where the money came from. And, uh, but pretty soon, IBM was the first to realize it, and others are uh, realizing it along the way, that uh, the margin in actually peddling devices has shrunk so much that you really want to think about what these devices can do to enhance the quality of life. And, uh, and that is, you know, you see a very simple example is you can get a cell phone for free and what you're paying for is a contract for uh, using it. And, uh, and, and that's uh, the way uh, imp companies are going towards is saying, you know, there are so, so, so much technology around us. We cannot make money selling the technology by itself. What are the services that we can provide on top of that? And, and, and the tipping point, as you point out, is the fact that, well, these, tech, these devices, when they exist in isolation, there's not much value to it. But when you can connect them all together and make them do things together, then there's a new value proposition. And that's what people have realized. There are new services that we can provide. Uh, you know, take, take uh, um, Uber, for instance, uh, technologies that, that, that very simple technology, but that enhances the, uh, the kind of service that you can all, all, uh, suddenly provide uh, to make the life of the average user uh, better. And so I would say the tipping point is really uh, the, uh, uh, the, the networking technologies coming to a point where these uh, devices can communicate with one another and, 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 and together they can provide a, a base, a platform from which interesting services can emanate. Kishore, um, industry, an uh, industry analysts talk about um, IoT chaos, the chaos in the IoT sector right now with respect to 
different network architectures, how different devices are, are there's different behaviors in different devices, and that lends itself to that chaos. What's the state of play right now for IoT with respect to that? That's an excellent question. I'll tell you that's in some sense the focus of some of the work that I do in my research. Uh, if you take at the bottom layer, you know, the physical layer, there is a variety of uh, networking technologies, all the way from cellular to wireless to uh, to, uh, uh, wi uh, to uh, uh, wired. Uh, both uh, both copper as well as fiber, and those are all different technologies that exist at the lowest level, and at the high level, uh, you know um, there are uh, 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 industries wanting to build applications, and and so there is a disconnect between the uh, the goal of the high level in wanting to build interesting services, and the uh, chaos that exists in terms of networking te technology. And what is missing in the middle is uh, a defining um, uh, uh, system layer that uh, brings, uh, in some sense, order to the chaos that exists at the lower level. And so uh, what is the right kind of programming model that you want in order to provide these kinds of services? If you want to build complex applications, uh, I'll give you a concrete example of a complex application. You know, there's heterogeneity in the, in the sensors that are being deployed in the environment. Take an airport, for instance. In the airport, you have cameras, and, uh, and there are other kinds of sensors. There are audio sensors, there is microphones, and, and then there is uh, if there are gas leaks and things like this, uh, and, and the temperature sensors. So, so many varieties of sensors are there. And why are they there? They are there to sort of look for anomalies that may come about in the normal course of operation. So if, if you look at normal people motion, that's okay, but commotion is not okay. Um, ambient noise is okay, but a loud noise is not okay. So there is a variety of uh, 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 cues that can result in triggering some action at the high level, right? And how do you make it all happen? And, and that is the complexity that, that, we, are, that we are faced with in, in uh, deploying this, whether you call it inf Internet of Things or cyber physical systems, it's all pointing to the same thing, that there is a variety of technologies, sensing technologies, networking technologies, computing capabilities that exist at the lower level. And there is the aspiration for uh, using these uh, myriad of sensors uh, in order to do something uh, good at the high level in terms of services that you want to provide. So there's, there's a missing piece in between. And, and that is the systems research that needs to happen in order to make it all come together. Kishore, we asked uh, a number of people today about uh, what you think the barrier, the primary barrier to entry would be or for the adoption of the Internet of Things space mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the value that, that that brings. What would be your opinion on that? So the primary barrier to adoption of IoT is that recognizing what is the value proposition for the end user. You know, to, to say that, well, you know, your toaster can talk and your fridge can talk, these are things that uh, doesn't make much of a sense from, a, uh, from an end user's perspective. So the, the real uh, barrier is identifying what may be a useful, so, you know, sometimes they, they use the word killer app, um, and, and, and sometimes it's uh, overused terminology. I don't like to use that, but, uh, but really we are saying what is a value proposition for the end user because of networking all these devices together. If, if, some, if uh, industries can figure that out, then all of the other things will fall into place. You, know, if you may have heterogeneity in the networks. You may have heterogeneity in the computing platforms. We'll find a way to solve all the problem if there is a value proposition up at the top, and that is really the barrier. Uh, to entry is really figuring out what is the, uh, the value proposition that we can provide uh, for the end user and then we can then work backwards and say, you know, how do we use these technologies for that particular value proposition. So would you say another barrier to uh, adoption of IoT may be the lack of confidence in what kind of network we should prepare for, whether that's a 3G, 4G or 5G network? I don't, once again, I don't think it is uh, the, uh, the network, which particular network to use or anything like that, that is the barrier. Really the barrier is, what is it that, that we can do at the high level and then work down, down, down the uh, uh, food chain and figure out what are the right technologies to use. In some sense, we have lots of technologies. It is just that we don't know how to deploy them in the context of an, in, an interesting service. I'll give you another example. Um, I work with my colleagues at Georgia Tech on 5G. And, uh, and here what we're trying to do is, we're saying, well, you know, there's Wi-Fi and there is uh, fiber. And uh, so far, 
you know, most of the applications that, uh, that uh, we are using with our cell phones and so on is not that demanding on latency. And more and more streaming services are coming about, and the uh, last mile becomes more of an issue. And when the last mile becomes more of an issue, Wi-Fi is not good enough. Can we combine Wi-Fi and 5G in order to provide better quality of service to the end user? So here again, if you talk to a Verizon or any of these um, uh, service providers, they are just taking the existing services and asking, what can 5G do to that ex existing service? In some sense, that's a wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, what are new services that we can envision? And then think about how 5G can provide the kind of um, infrastructure for, for that. So in some sense, uh, starting at the top allows you to be more prescriptive as to what should be done in the networking and the technology layers than the other way around saying, that oh, we have this cool technology, what can you use it, use it for? Kishore, we have um, uh, the Future of the Network documentary is a series. Our next um, episode of that series is on data centers. I um, want to find out from you to make a segue between what we're talking about now and that mm -hmm. episode. Mm -hmm. What is the role that IoT plays now and yeah. in the future in yeah. data centers? So, you know, I, I, I wanted to start talking about cloud computing even before, um, but I refrained from that because, uh, uh, because the, uh, uh, the, the way cloud computing is right now focused on throughput oriented applications. Now, uh, it, and, you know, your data center may be in, uh, um, in Ohio or in, uh, you know, in, in Phoenix and so on. And, and the sensing data that IoT is uh, bringing to the, uh, uh, to the forefront is right here in Vegas. And you need computing capabilities close to the edge of the network in order to process that in a timely fashion. And so you know, what is going to happen in the future is that data center services being confined to you know, uh, uh, some cold rooms in Phoenix uh, that's not going to work. You need, uh, uh, you need computing capabilities uh, closer to the edge of the network in order to do the sensing, the processing of the sensing data mm -hmm. that is emanating from all around us. And mobile sensing is becoming very important. I mean, now there are automobiles that can drive on their own, right? And if they have to talk to one another, you need com computing capabilities that is integrating that close to where the action is. And that cannot be sent to the data center. Mm -hmm. Um, so what is going to happen is that data center services that we are now uh, used to, like Amazon Cloud or um, you know, the Google Cloud and so on, which is um, in, in a distant place, that have to come closer to the edge of the network. And, uh, and in this context, there is a, um, a new vision that Cisco came up with a, a couple of years back called fog computing. Mm -hmm. And you can see the sort of analogy that uh, cloud computing is up there. Mm. Fog is closer to the ground. <laughs> so in other words, uh, fog is closer to where the sensors are. And, and so by, by having computational capabilities close to where the sensors are, um, you can actually do the processing uh, where it really makes sense. So you want to shrink, I mentioned earlier, that you want to shrink the latency between sensing and actuation. And that means that you want to push the computation as close to the edge of the network. You might, you might do some of the computation in the sensors themselves. There are smart cameras today. Um, but they may not have enough computational capabilities to do everything that you wanted to do. So uh, that is the thing that you're going to see in the future is the evolution of data center kind of services going towards the edge of the network because latency sensitive applications are the ones that are going to be driving the IoT space, not throughput oriented applications. Kishore, there seems to be a real human element to the value of IoT. Can you give us a couple of examples of that, of that human element? Well, so one of the things that is very interesting for me is uh, today um, we, um, uh, we have these uh, uh, cab services like Uber. And, uh, and, you know, and it, is, it is really banking on the technology that's available, that the cell phone technology and the sensing technology that's available that lets uh, uh, you know, matchmaking to happen between the consumer and, and the service. And uh, interestingly, uh, such a service existed long back in Singapore. Uh, but it was very manual. Uh, what they used to do was, uh, you know, you, you can you can uh, using uh, using a telephone, um, they'll they'll find out the the calling area, and from that they'll find who is the cab that is near the calling area and dispatch that person over there. Or they'll also ha look at uh, the queue buildup 
in a uh, outside a shopping mall and then figure out that oh there's more people there so uh, we'll send more cabs over there so these are very manual intensive uh, ways of uh, um, of attacking a particular societal need and and now technology uh, like uber uh, is extremely important especially in the developed world where there is not that that much people power um, and technology can supplant what uh, human force can do in countries like Singapore or China or in, in, or in India. Um, so that is uh, one uh, uh, good example. Um, and, and in general, I think um, uh, IoT space uh, should be really focused on enhancing the quality of life and, and how it can benefit the society. And, and this goes back to one of your earlier questions, what are the technology barriers? I don't think there is a technology barrier. It is really imagination barrier. Um, you have to imagine what kinds of services that can increase the quality of life. And, and uh, uh, in, the, in this vein, um, what IBM has been doing is very interesting. One of the things that they've been doing is uh, uh, they've been uh, championing this notion of smart cities. And, um, uh, and, and uh, one of the things that they did started doing, it wasn't easy to do in the United States because of regulatory uh, consideration, but they were able to do it outside of uh, United States and other parts of the world. And, and, and they're, they're just starting to do that in the United States also. Um, uh, an example is uh, water meters. Well, all the water meters um, uh, have sensing. And um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, IBM did um, in a small town in Ohio is uh, either Ohio or Iowa, I'm not absolutely certain, uh, but one of those Midwestern states, uh, they took a small town and, uh, and, they, and they looked at the, uh, the water meters of, uh, uh, of, of a neighborhood and, uh, and they could find out if, uh, if an individual's consumption is more than uh, the average uh, in, the, in that area. So that flags that, oh, maybe something is wrong, some leakage is there in the house or something like that. So these are ways in which you can actually provide a value to the end user by, by using the sensing technology and the data that you collect to sort of uh, look at what may be problematic about what's going on. And I think similar things has to happen in the space as a whole. Traffic congestion is another uh, concrete example. Right now, uh, you know, there are lots of cameras. If you go on the highways, there are cameras everywhere. And if you go to the airport again, there are lots of cameras. But most of these cameras are being used for offline analysis. And you know, especially in an airport, uh, what, what, what uh, these camera uh, feeds are doing is they're going to a monitoring room, and there's a bank of maybe 20, 30 monitors. And a human is sitting in front of these monitors and trying to figure out if there's anything, anything anomalous happening just doesn't scale if you have thousands of cameras. And what they're doing is they're dumping everything into DVRs so that if something happens, they can go back and see what was the cause of it. What needs to happen today is, is really sort of catching it at the time that it happens. So uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, we're gonna see more and more as technology matures and uh, more importantly, um, you know, uh, uh, harnessing this technology for services uh, matures uh, we will see more of these kinds of things happening. Kishore, it was nice talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.